Well, it's great to be here. Welcome to Tabernacle of Yeshua. This morning, my name is Pastor Manny, and it is a great and beautiful Sunday. Look, I'm going to get into the Word, but before we do that, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to begin. Praise God. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who's the teacher and the counselor. He's going to reveal to us and teach us, Lord, the words of certainty, the words of truth. Lord, we look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Father God, we commit unto you today. Lord, not by might, not by strength, but by your Spirit, you said to Zerubbabel, Father, Lord, that this was going to take place, the great day of atonement, Lord. We declared in your wonderful name, the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, God bless you this morning, all those who are listening and tuning in all over the world. It is an honor to be here. My name is Pastor Manny Edwards, and I'm standing here today at Tabernacle of Yeshua um, and the church. We're going online simply because of what is taking place. But this morning, I had a few thoughts, and I just want to begin to break down a few areas. And I want to start in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 11. If you'd like to turn there this morning, 3.11. Everything I'm going to speak about this morning works inwardly in the believer. I want you to know that, that when the word is working in you mightily, it's one, it's personal, second, it's internal, and three, it's intimate. So when the working of God's word is taking place in the believer, it's always working from the inward and then expressing outwardly. Amen? If we go on in the word, we're going to find that principle and establish it, that when God is working with the believer, he starts always from the inside. There's a bearing of the witness of the word, and the expression of that word then brings life and change and transformation. I'll say it again. Everything that God is doing, it's personal. Everything that God is doing, it's internal. It's in us. It's not outside of you. It's in you. And thirdly, it's intimate. God is one in a relationship with his sons. Amen? So this morning, Matthew 3.11, if we would go there, I'm just going to pick up on the reading. It was in the days of John the Baptist and when he was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. We find that there, this progressive revelation of God's word, that we need to understand that God is progressively revealing to us revelation that we might walk into the understanding of the day of the Lord. And that's a, a great understanding and a great revelation, but we've got to know it's progressive. Everything is packed in our spirit, but it must unload or unpack itself in our life. Amen? So I just want to give you this, the principle of three for interpretation of the word of God. It says in Matthew chapter 3, 11, talking about the baptism, the scripture says this, I indeed baptize you with water, one, unto repentance. But he that cometh, John was talking about Jesus, after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. I shall baptize you, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, two, and with fire. So he emphasizes in the word the principle of three. First, baptism of the water. Second, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Third, baptism of a fire. Now, this principle is progressive. In our understanding, we're going to find out this morning that when God uses three, he's using the certainty of truth. A lot of ministries that we've got to get a hold of this morning, if we're going to know the certainty of God's truth, according to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 20, the scripture says this, Have I not written to thee excellent things in counsel and my knowledge? So here, Proverbs begins to write, Proverbs, the word of God, begins to declare, Have not I written the excellent? That word excellent in the Hebrew is sholesh. Now, sholesh, the terminology of excellence, that you and I might know the counsel and the knowledge of God's will, is that word excellent simply means a triple or a third. It's a principle of a threefold. So when God's counsel and his knowledge is coming to us, for us to establish a pattern or establish biblical interpretation of the word of God, this progressive walk, there's always a pattern of three. So the word excellent in the Hebrew again is sholesh. It means triple, third, threefold. I'll give you a, a, a picture to that. In the armies, there's three ranks. One, you would have the shield carrier, would be your first one. Second, you would have an officer. And thirdly, you would have a captain. That's the three ranks. So you start up as a shield bearer, footman, soldier. Then you move up the rank to an officer. And thirdly, then you transition into the captain. So that's the principle of the word excellence. I just want to go on to Proverbs 22, verse 21 now. So when God is revealing to us the excellent things, he reveals it by the principles of three. Amen. 
Verse 21 of Proverbs 22, the word says this, that I might make known the certainty of the words of truth. This is the word of God. If you want to understand the certainty of the word of truth, there is establishment of God's principle in teams or in groups of threes. See, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and then I am the life. He established the certainty of truth by word. He said, I am way, truth, and the life. That's the principle of three. Now here, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, most of the church age, we've only heard the baptism of water, baptism of the Spirit, but we rarely have heard or understood the baptism of the fire. And it's very interesting that scripture highlighted not only the baptism of a water unto repentance, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and with fire, baptism of fire. The Holy Spirit is the fire, but we need to understand what that fire is and the intent of what the Holy Spirit and what God is wanting to do with the third baptism. Are you there this morning? Praise God. Three baptisms, one of water, one of the Holy Spirit, then one of the fire. Well, Pastor Manny, what is the fire? I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But just establishing the principle of three that I might know the certainty of the truth of God's word. You'll find this in the pattern. Jesus says in John 14, 6, what did he say? I am the way, the truth, the life. Now, in the Old Testament, Moses established the principle. He established a, a pattern that you and I could go by. When they designed the tabernacle, we know that the tabernacle had three courts. One court was called the outer court. When they walk into the next dimension of the tabernacle, they would now be in the holy place. And if they'd go one more, they would be then into the holiest of all. That was a, a, the certainty of God's truth. Out of court, holy place, holiest of all. The way, the truth, the life. Baptism of water, baptism of the spirit, baptism of the fire. Amen. Can I give you one more? To know the certainty of truth according to the word of God, God ministers his word to the believers by milk and by the bread, then the meat. These three establish the certainty of truth. So when we begin our walk, a lot, most of the times, some people can be babes in the faith they're referred to. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. We're going to go there and we can read this. But milk of the word are for the babes. That's another level of, another level of the establishment of the excellence of three. So you have babes of the faith, young men of the faith, fathers of the faith. Milk of the word, bread of the word, meat of the word. Milk of the word, according to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. We're just going to turn there. I'll read this one out for you. Hebrews 5, 12 says this. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone, verse 13, for everyone that uses milk, this is milk of the word, milk is unskillful in the word of righteous. He is a babe. So now we begin to see the principle of three working. According to the word of God, there can be babes of the faith, young childs of the faith. Then we can see young men of the faith. They eat a different level of the word. They're partaking of the word, the bread of the word. But then there are those who are the fathers, they're eating the meat of the of the word. So again, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. It says this, but strong meat, strong meat belong to them that are full age, fully mature, even those who by reason of use have their exercise or their senses exercised to discern both good and both evil. Hallelujah. We're just establishing the principle of three this morning to know the certainty of the truth of God's word. So we'll see now that there's establishment of the pattern of three. God is progressively walking his children from babes of the faith to young men of the faith to fathers of the faith. This is a progressive revelation. We're moving from the outer court into the holy place, into the holiest of all. We're coming through the way, understanding the truth, expressing the life of the word. What is the milk of the word? It's unskilled in the word of righteousness. The young men are given according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. Bread is given to the young men, to those who overcome the wicked one. 
So the bread of the word, when we're eating of the bread of the word, not of the milk of the word, we're now changing our diet and we're now moving progressively to eat now the bread of the word. Bread speaks of the word. When we're eating bread of the word, we're classed as young men. So the bread of the word is given that you and I might overcome the wicked one. Now that word wicked one there is not an entity outside of us. That word wicked simply means the unbelief. When we're eating and partake, partaking of the word, the bread of truth, it deals with our wicked one. It deals with our personal, internal, and intimate. Our unbelief. 99% of the time, we're dealing or we're struggling to believe the word. So the unbelief, as we eat more of the bread of the word of truth, guess what it's dealing? It's dealing with the wicked one. It's dealing with the character of this unbelief that sits inside the core of our soul. Not in your spirit, man, not in your spirit, but in the core of your soul, in order to change your natural physical body, the way that you walk, talk, and live life. Amen? So this is the establishment of God's word. Unskilled in the word of righteous, milk of the word. Overcome the wicked one, bread of the word. Now the meat of the word is for the fathers. It's the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. I might just read that one for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. The word says this. Paul, he said, For who has known the mind of, of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. That's the meat of the word. That's the mind of Christ. It's the fullness of the mind of Christ. Amen. That you and I might know and understand the Father and the intention of the eternal will. John chapter 4, 14 verse 3. Praise God. John 14 verse 3 this morning. So the word is progressively walking us into... From glory to glory, we are being transformed by the same spirit that's with inside of us, the word says. So we are progressively moving from glory to glory. Outer court has a, has, has a level of glory. Holy place has a level of glory. Holiest of all is the fullness of God's glory and intention. Amen. So John 14, this morning, verse 3. Just listen to the words of Jesus. Scripture says this, 14 verse 3, Jesus speaking, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he's talking about a place that is going to be prepared for us, but this place that, that he might come and that he might be with us. He's preparing this place. Verse 4 now, he says, Whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. So there is a way and a way of life that God is wanting us to come and to move into, amen, an understanding of his word. This place that he is preparing for us, we're going to discover that God is going to begin to equip us with the understanding of his word. John chapter 3, verse 5. John 3, verse 5. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. We're just laying out the pattern or the understanding of the principle of three according to the word of God. So John chapter 3 verse 5 says this. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says this. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit too, he cannot enter, meaning become one with, into the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus and Jesus having the conversation, the principle of the certainty of truth. Unless one is born of water and of the spirit, cannot enter. Third one, or become, the word enter means to become one with the kingdom of God. This is to know that the certainty of God's truth. Now I've just done a little bit of a, a graph here this morning that I want to show you. There are three major feasts that God has required man to come before him. Those three major feasts is Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacle. You'll find that in the book of Leviticus. Now you find that in that place that God told man to come to him, not empty-handed before for him. Once again, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacle. I just want to say that over here you will see that 
in Pentecost, in the believer, where you and I are born again, most of the time, we've got to know that Matthew 3.11 says that this is the baptism of water. That's the establishment of this principle. Then we find in Pentecost, second feast, it's all internal, it's all personal, and it's all intimate. That inside of us, that in Pentecost, the baptism here was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now there's evidence that comes with that. You're filled with the Holy Ghost and the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's a very true and authentic experience of the spiritual realities that Jesus has paid the price for that you and I can benefit out of our spirit man. Once again, water, baptism of the water, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Most of this, water and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the church fundamentally understands and walks in that understanding. Very few, but can I say, begin to get the understanding of what the intention of the baptism of the fire is, according to Matthew chapter 3, 11. There is a baptism of fire, baptism of water, the certainty of God's truth. There is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, but and with fire. That's refined as fire. We need to know this. So God is progressively walking the church through this understanding that we're being water baptized. Nicodemus, when Jesus said, he said to him, unless you are born of the water and of the spirit, Passover, Pentecost, you cannot enter. He shifts over now into the kingdom. Enter meaning to become one with the kingdom. He is the church age. We work and we function according to that area. But when we move across, we're moved across because of the refiner's fire. The intent of the word now takes us into becoming one with the kingdom. And that's where we're going. So this morning, I want to take us into this area. We know a lot about this. We've, the experience of the church age has been great for the last 2,000 years. But now we are entering into a feast that God is releasing that you and I need to come into. And most of the church, we've experienced feast of Passover, feast of Pentecost. Very rarely have we heard about the language of the Feast of Tabernacle. So this morning, according to the Word of God, we can turn to now the certainty of God's truth. He is progressively walking us through this process. Passover, ball of water, baptism of water. Here, Pentecost, personal, internal, and intimate. Feast of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in tongues. Two-thirds of the way. Can I say, as we go into the final third, three... That the Feast of Tabernacles now, this is a baptism of fire. What fire? This is refiner's fire. Now, according to Scripture, there is three types of fires. One fire is called the furnace of fire. Second fire is called hell's fire. Third fire is called refiner's fire. I'll just put this out there this morning, that the refiner's fire really comes down to the condition of the believer understanding the word and the intention of the word. So this refiner's fire, we need to know about and we need to walk in it because it's going to take us into the kingdom. It's going to cause us to become one with his word. Amen? Praise God. This is a progressive understanding. We know that in Passover, we know that there was an agreement. In Pentecost, there was a union. In Feast of Tabernacles, there's oneness. That's the progressive revelation of God's word. And it comes in the principles of three. God, praise God this morning. Malachi chapter 3 this morning. We're talking about the refiner's fire now. We understand the baptism of fire. We've had the baptism of the water, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we're having the baptism of the fire. It is the Holy Spirit, but he has an intent of the Father's will. There's an intention over here in the refiner's fire. Malachi chapter 3 this morning. Verse 1 and 2, let's read it. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So the fire is preparing the way before him, amen? And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You're the temple of the living God. You, he shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. What covenant? The eternal covenant. This is the only covenant that Jesus has brought us back, access into the Father, to the eternal covenant, amen? Which is the will of the Father. That you and I might go on to become sons of the living God, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, say, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, this is where we want to read. But, here it is, who may abide the day of his coming? Now, a lot of times in scripture, that reference to that word, the day of his coming, that day is the day of atonement. It's the day of the Lord. Same reference, word phrase, a little bit different in its interpretation, its translation, but it is the reference point to the Day of Atonement. 
We're going to talk about that this morning because we need to know that we're moving up into progressively into the Feast of Tabernacles. Here this fire is coming. It's coming to do something. Who can stand and abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he, he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire in a fuller's soap. So here we begin to understand now there's two parts to the refiner's fire. One, there's going to be the refiner's fire, which is the purging out of the man of sin. That's in the core of my soul. It's nothing to do in my spirit. In the Feast of Tabernacles, this word is moving from my spirit down to deal with the core of my soul. You are spirit, you have a soul, and you are in a physical body. That's the three dimensions that God works personally, internally, and intimately. When you were born again, he worked in you personally, internally, and intimately. It was all inside of you. The effect of it permeated then from your spirit, touched your soul, and your life began to change, and you walked in the understanding of that change. Amen? So, here we are now. He is coming to the house of God, to the temple, like a refiner's fire. That's the purging out. But then he said, like a fool of soap. The second thing he's going to do, after the purging out of the man of sin in the core of my soul, is that he's going to wash the area of the soul. Why? He needs to make sure that it's without blemish nor spot. He did this in Ephesians chapter 5. It's the mystery of the marriage of the Lamb. But I don't want to go there. I just want to stay on this focus of the understanding of the refiner's fire. Amen. He is like, that terminology in verse 2. For he is like, that word he is like, I want you to underline that. That he is like is a very powerful reference. It allows us room for interpretation. Jesus said this in the New Testament. He said, heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. Heaven is like. He said again, he said, heaven is like a mustard seed. Jesus again, he said, heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. So that word is like allows the, the reader or allows the minister to understand that there gives us room to interpret. <laughs> what? Interpret what? Take it up into a higher dimension now and understand the purpose and the intention of what God is doing. Take it from the, the natural, but lift it up now into the spirit. He is like. He is like. Meaning that there's a word coming and it's going to be like a refiner's fire. Amen? This work is internal, it's personal, and it's intimate where God is wanting to take us in the understanding of his word. The refiner's fire says he's going to purge out the men of sin. That word purge, the word refiner's fire, in the Hebrew simply means a goldsmith. So it's a terminology used to testing and to proving the quality of what? One's faith. Your faith has to be tested for the quality. Yes, it does. Faith without being tested can never, it never produces anything. Got to know that. So faith in Passover, babes of the faith, faith is tested to a level. And if they're tested and they go on, they walk on progressively, they, they want more of the Holy Spirit, what happens? Internally inside of them, their faith is then tested again. And the Holy Spirit is given, the reward is the Holy Spirit is given, and the evidence of speaking in tongues. Faith has been tested. So it is. Passover and Pentecost, if we walk it one more step over into tabernacle, faith is going to be tested again by the refiner's fire. There's a language, there's things that God has given us that he has proposed for us and in us, but the word has to be tested. <laughs> and he's going to do the testing by the refiner's fire. Amen. Now the word full of soap, that's a washing agency. There's going to come a washing of the water by the word, says, says the word of God. So we're going to understand that refiner fire is going to do two things in our life. It's going to purge out the man of sin that sits in the core of my soul, deals with the wicked and the unbelief that's sitting inside me. And secondly, while he does that and he removes the core, the, the core he removes the, the head out of the core of the realm of the soul, he takes away the man of sin, then he can do the washing of the water by the word. Amen. This is a prophetic understanding of God's word that you and I might know the certainty of truth. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. If we can turn there this morning, I want to read this one out to you. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. This is a prophetic 
gesture. It is a prophetic understanding of the word. Those to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that those who will not come up out of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, up, even upon them shall no rain be given. And if the family of Egypt do not go up or do not come up into the Feast of Tabernacles that have no rain, there shall be the plague there and the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So here we have this feast that God is wanting all of mankind to come up into. We've had the Feast of Passover. We've had the Feast of Pentecost. This is the church age. But when we come across here to enter into the kingdom, this is another area now that God is progressively walking us across. The church age is a scaffold. It's to, it gives us blessings. It gives us a measure. All of those things are good and true, but it sets us up for the main game, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles over here is where we are walking or becoming one with the kingdom. Amen? So if we don't come up, we get no rain. Rain, according to the word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, is this. Let my revelation or let my word fall as the rain. So God's word, symbolically, when it falls in scripture like rain, wherever you see rain, like in the days of Noah, so shall the day, days of the coming of the Son of Man be. It was raining in the Old Testament. That rain was symbolic. It carried a principle behind it, which is the rain of God's revelation of his word. There is going to come a rain and a revelation of God's word to give us the insight into the way, the truth, and ultimately the life of this word. This is progressive understanding and it's the certainty of God's truth. We're not going to walk in dimness of eye in this feast. God is going to give us the eyes to see, ears to hear, mouth to speak, hands to do, feet to walk, heart to believe. The perfecting of the saints. Amen? So here we have this progressive revelation. We're moving up into the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if we just come across here, I've broken this up here for the believer. I've got the church age here, Passover, Pentecost, sit in that domain. Blessings are there, certainty of God's truth, but the main game is over here to enter, to become with, this is all kingdom now. Baptism of water, baptism of the spirit, baptism of fire. So the refiner's fire, Matthew 3.11, the principle is now to come across to go into the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the Feast of Tabernacles has three smaller feasts. The first feast is trumpets, second is the atonement, Feast of Atonement, and finally they call Tabernacle proper. So here, when we come across here, the first feast or the expression that opens up inside of us that God is trying to do by the Holy Spirit is the Feast of Trumpets. Now trumpets in scripture are the servants. It's the prophetic language of the word of God. He gives us understanding. So here we get the gifts of the eye to see and the ear to hear. That's why Jesus kept on using the reference term, he that has an ear to hear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So this terminology here, in the Feast of Trumpets now, God is schooling and training us in the eye to see, ear to hear, heart to receive and to believe the word of God in order for us to do the hands and the work, to walk this walk out. Where? Walk where? Walk to the Day of Atonement. A reference to that Day of Atonement, this is the straight and the narrow gate. We're going into the Day of Atonement. Act one meant to become one in that area of the feast. So the marriage covenant of the Father, it's all inside of us. This is by law and by principles of the word of God. This is personal, internal, and intimate. So here, we get eyes to see, ears to hear. This is our training ground in how God is beginning to remove the scales from our eyes that we can understand prophetically the word of God to see the path. And I just want to talk a little bit on that area on this Feast of Trumpets. Praise God. 1 Corinthians this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 10. Now Paul is speaking. Well, we might pick it up in verse 1 just to give, the, give an insight to the passage. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, matured sons, but as unto carnal, even as babes of Christ. So he's talking to babes of Christ. 
Look at this, the principle again. I have fed you with milk, milk of the word, and not with meat, where the matured mind of Christ is. For there too, you were not able to bear it, neither were you now able to. For you are yet carnal. For where there is division among you, envy, strife, and division, are you not yet carnal and walk as mere men? A lot of the time in church age, here, it's a lot of doctrines here. Here we come over into the kingdom. It's the unity of the faith. It's the eternal will of the Father. It's sonship. Doctrines in the church age, unity of the faith, the eternal will of the Father. There's only one thing that we're going to learn and understand and walk into. That's the unity of the faith. That's the will of the Father, the eternal covenant. So here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According now to the grace of God, which is given unto me, this is all God's grace, grace is God's provision, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and now the buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Verse 11. For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, that right there, according to the word of God, shows one company of people, another company of people. The gold, silver, and the precious stones, gold is the Father, silver is the Holy Spirit, precious stones is the Son. The wood, hay, and the stubble speaks about things that can, there's no oil, or it's a loss of inheritance. This is in the believer. But how is this going to work out? How is this going to take place? Verse 13 tells us, Every man's work, every believer's work, shall be made manifested for the day. Everyone say day. There it is, that terminology. The day of the Lord. The day of atonement. That's where we're going. This feast of trumpets now is giving us to the eyes to see, ears to hear. It's taking us into our atonement. That's the day. The day shall declare it. How? It shall be revealed by fire. What fire? This is refiner's fire. This is the word of God. Is now working with the intention to work within us to remove the wood, hay, and the stubble. That's things that are corruptible, things that have been that are no not need or necessary in our life. It's going to be dealt with by the refiner's fire. The fire is also going to reveal to the believer the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. Anything that you have within you that is of God, it will only enhance your walk with God. This fire is going to increase you. Gold is the Father, silver is the Holy Spirit, precious stones. It's the symbol of Jesus, the Son of the living God. All of this is going to be revealed by the fire. What fire, Pastor Manny? Refine his fire. So let's keep on reading. The fire shall try every man's work and what sort it is. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For if any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive the reward. This fire is not going to hurt you. This fire is not going to kill you. This fire is not sent by God to destroy you. This fire is to work and in the intention of the Father's will to purge out the man of sin in the core of your soul, to take him out of the way, to take that big head out of the way, in order that he might come and sit in the core of your soul, the man Christ. The reward that we're going to receive, that's the inheritance. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, suffer loss, or he shall suffer loss, listen to this, but he himself shall be saved. This fire is going to come, it's going to work in the believer. And even if he suffers loss, he will be saved. God is just, he will give the portion of the reward to the believer. If you wanted to walk in Passover and be born of water, there's a portion, there's a reward in that. But if you go on with God, those who are hungry and desire more, go on. He breaks open inside of the believer in Pentecost and you experience the benefits of the Feast of Pentecost. You're empowered to live a better life. You're given the evidence of speaking in tongues. You work and you operate in your earthly ministry. Prophecy, um, gifts of tongues, gifts and edification. All these things, word of knowledge, all these things um, work in you, in the believer. There's a reward. 
If we can get those two, those first two thirds, the last third, we can say again, there's going to be a reward. So what is the reward here? The mind of Christ, fullness of sonship. That's the reward. That's where God is taking us. That's where sin will have no dominion over you. Sickness must flee. Death, where is your sin? All these things come, and the benefits of the reward is inside of you, but it's with the word when you cross over into the kingdom age. Hallelujah. And it's got to come by the refiner's fire. For if any, man shall, uh, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. There's a portion of reward there. Yet so as by fire. Know ye not, verse 16, that you are the temple. That word is not haron. It is the word naos in the Greek. Haron is physical. Naos is the symbolic or it's the spiritual house of God. So he's saying that this, the naos, you are the naos. You are the spiritual dwelling place of the Father and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Where's God? He's not outside of you. He's in you. All the benefits of Passover and Pentecost happened inside of you. Not outside of you, inside of you. This happened. Zechariah, quickly this morning, let's go. Zechariah 13, verse 8. The refiner's fire. God is progressively walking us on. Because God knows in his infinite wisdom and understanding that as little children of the faith, he needs to walk us through because if God was to fully eradicate out of us and give us full power and full authority and dominion, we would not manage it. We wouldn't have the character equal with the word. So here, we're going to pick up this passage in Zechariah 13, verse 8. Let's have a look at the word. I might start out verse... Verse 8 will start out. It shall come to pass. That's a very powerful word phrase gives us room again. It's exactly like it is like. It shall come to pass. Meaning, it's a prophetic gesture to what is coming up ahead in the future. But he was referring to this time now. Right now where I'm standing. It shall come to pass that in all of the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the third shall be left. Now I just want to look at this principle carefully. You'll see here Over here, Scripture has said that two parts therein it shall be cut off. So this is the principle of the Word of God. We're talking about threes to know the certainty. He's talking about two parts. This first part is one third. Two parts. Another third. So here, the two thirds here, this is Passover. This here is Pentecost. This is the two-thirds. This here is a different company here. This last third is a different company of people. Passover, born again of water. Pentecost, born again of the Holy Spirit. Empowered to live a better life. There are rewards in each feast. Each expressions of the word. But here, Zechariah 13, verse 8 says this. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts thereof shall be cut off. The word cut off there means to be separated. There's going to come a separation. How's the separation going to take place, Pastor Manny? Well, according to the word, it's by fire. The refiner's fire is going to separate those who are going to come out from the church age and those who are going to enter into become one in the kingdom age. To enter to become one with the kingdom. So here we have Passover, Pentecost. That's the two-thirds he's talking about. They will be cut off. They will be separated and given their portion of the reward of their inheritance. God is a just God. He's a rewarding God. Scripture says those who seek him diligently in Passover, those who seek him diligently in Pentecost, receive their reward. Now, I'm not belittling that in any way. That is a strong spiritual experience that God has. But can I say, this two-thirds, that there has a measure. Here is the fullness. This third here, this one-third, this final one-third here, that's two-thirds, but this one-third here, this company of people that go into this, that's the Feast of Tabernacle people. That's a company of people that have gone into entered and to become one with the language of this Feast of Tabernacle. It says that 
This here will be cut off and it shall die. The word die in scripture here doesn't mean you're going to be killed. No, it means the word die here means you're going to be separated and given your portion of the inheritance. Praise God. But the third shall be left therein. What third? This third. What third? Tabernacle people. That company now he begins to talk about. They, verse 9, it says this, Zechariah 13, verse 9. The scripture says this. I will bring a third part through the fire. <laughs> what fire? That's refiner's fire. Baptism of water, baptism of spirit, baptism of the fire. They go on to understand the intent of the spirit of God. And he's coming to the house as a refiner's fire. So here now we see he's talking specifically about this company of people in the Feast of Tabernacles. He said, this third I will bring through the fire. That's a company of people. I will refine that third, it says, I will refine them as silver is refined. I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. I will hear them and I will say, it is my people. That's a personal touch there <laughs> by God. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Praise God. So here, we find now the third. That's very powerful language. We pick up in the book of Revelations, chapter 8, trumpets 1, 2, 3, and 4. He hits the third. He's dealing with this company of people that want to go in to the separation, the full separation inside of them, to deal with the law of sin and death, to deal with the man of sin. This company of people love their lives not unto death, meaning that they are willing to go in to be fully separated and understand the purpose of the intention of God. Are you all right there this morning? That's a powerful terminology. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. The scripture says this, the word says this, I counsel you. He's talking to the church. I counsel you. I'm giving you instructions. I'm counseling you to buy from me gold tried in the fire. Now, a lot of people will say that's faith. Yes, it is. And faith, according to the word of God in Romans, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Faith is the word. Faith is the word. There's a word of Passover. There's a measure of the word in Pentecost. There's a measure now of the word. It's the fullness of God's word in tabernacle. I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the, in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and a white raiment clothed with the garment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This is all powerful prophetic language. Notice that this company of people that go on to gold that is tried in the fire they're also going to be clothed with the clothing that is going to remove away the shame of thy nakedness. I just want to talk a little bit about the clothing. Why white raiment? Here in this feast, in the feast of tabernacles that we're in, when we get into the Day of Atonement, we get this language, it's blowing over the, the sacrifice. Numbers 10.10 10 says that. Blow the trumpet over the burnt sacrifice. The purpose of the prophetic language of God's word is not to just, who glory, who revelation, who revelation, who revelation about this and that. that. There's a lot of revelation going around in the prophetic time where this is happening in the Feast of Tabernacles. But... The purpose, the intention that God decided was that the trumpet must be placed over the burnt sacrifice. It's got to be placed over, meaning direct the prophetic word over the day of your atonement. That's the day of fire. That's the day of the refiner's fire. So here, the day of atonement. That's where we're going. So we're going to direct that word over to that feast. It's unveiling that atonement, the day of atonement within us. Amen. That's what we've got to do. Now, in the Feast of Atonement, the high priest in the Old Testament, what he would do, he would change a garment. In the outer court, after the killing and the slayings of the lambs and the washing and the burnings that would take place in the outer court, he would be covered in blood. So what he would do was he would take that garment off and then he would walk into and he would change his robes to go into the holy place. So every time there was a changing of a garment to enter into each, each dimension. When you and I walk through this feast and we change our clothes, we get a language with it, a character, a language comes with the clothing. Notice that these people have a white raiment. White speaks about the Day of Atonement. They walk in the understanding and that it may 
that the shame of the nakedness do not appear. What does this mean? We're going to walk in the understanding of the day of our atonement in order that you and I would not be naked in our understanding. We'd understand the where, where, when, why and how, what God is doing with us. Matthew chapter 22 verse 11. Matthew 22 verse 11. We're just talking about these, the raiment clothes, the white raiment clothes that we need to be dressed in. Matthew 22 verse 11. This is the parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables. So we need to know that this parable that he talks about the wedding, that this is symbolic, prophetic language. So we have the rights to lift it up into the spirit for interpretation, a fuller understanding. We know the parable very, very well. We know that the servants went forth. The husbandry, he sent out, the master of the house sent out for um, people to come and the servants, but people were bidden to come. Everyone had excuses according to the word of God. Everyone was too busy doing everything. Um, and here the marriage and the wedding feast was being prepared. But here in verse 11, Now when the king came in to see the guests, he saw that there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. Everyone say wedding garment. Here now we have the wedding, the wedding feast, the love feast, the main game that we're set up for, people of God. This is, this is truly to our day, the wedding feast. Here, that there was a man in that company that had not on the wedding garment. Watch what happens in verse 12. And he said unto him, Friend, how cometh thou hither to not having a wedding garment? Why do you not have a wedding garment on? Where, what, how and why are you sitting here without a wedding garment? Notice what happens in verse 12. And the man responded, he was speechless. Meaning, he didn't have the understanding nor the revelation of the language of the Day of Atonement. He didn't have the language to walk in what God had provided for. He was speechless. He was dressed in the wrong language. So in Passover and in Pentecost, there's a language. There is a, is a nature. There is a character that speaks. And because there's a character that speaks, it brings forth a language. Over here in the Feast of Tabernacles, we're clothed with a new, new garment, a new language. And so we speak with that language and that understanding of the Day of Atonement. Praise God. But this man was speechless. He didn't have the revelation of the hour. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, which is the prophetic word of God. This word and this feast is going to find out all those who have not the language or the understanding for the end time. For the servants which speak about the prophetic word, the servants, the word, the prophetic nature of the word, bind them, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him to outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the separation. That's the two-thirds, if you want to put it again like that. That's the cutoff. They will receive their reward, but as for the marriage supper of the Lamb, they do not enter to become one with, they are not the bride. This is the language of the Spirit of God. Here we see that this word is going to do, it's going to bind them hand and foot. Hand to do the will of the Father, feet to walk it out. They will not be permitted to walk this out. They do not have the language, nor are they in a position to walk this to becoming the bride. Born again and saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, but not one with the purpose and the intention of the will of the Father, which is the eternal covenant. Amen? Bind him hand, foot, hand to do the will, foot to walk it out. They will not be able to do the will of the Father, nor to walk it out. Take him away. Now watch this. Cast him into outer darkness. A lot of interpretation, by biblical interpretation, a lot of the time ministries refer to this as hell. There's no mention of hell here. Cast him into outer darkness. So what is the word going to do? The word is going to find out all the actors in the end time. It's the word. All I've got to do is stand here and the word is going to do the, do the separation. As the messenger of the word of God, all I have to do is lay down the word, speak it, and watch now. God is going to gather up those which are the tares and those which are of, um, you know, of the wheat. The separation is going to be done by the word. It's not, I don't have to go over and say, you're in, you're in. No, the word is going to find out who is wanting to go on into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who is going to go into the straight and the narrow gate. It says, cast him out into outer darkness. That's not hell. Outer darkness simply means this. Away from that glory. 
Passover and Pentecost both have a portion of glory. Scripture says that we're going to go, we look into a mirror dimly, but then we're going to see, we're going to see then from glory to glory. Moving from glory to glory to glory. We're being transformed. Company in Passover and Pentecost, a measure and a level of transformation. But here, ultimately, here is where the true transformation of God's word is going to take place in the believer. Amen. I'm just trying to bring this home now. Time's sake. They'll be cast into outer darkness, away from this level of the glory. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That word weeping simply means no understanding. Matthew 25 says this, 10 versions, five wise, five foolish, five had the oil, they had the understanding, five foolish didn't have the oil, they didn't have the understanding, they were weeping that they didn't go in to become one with the marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage covenant. And it says here, weeping, gnashing of the teeth. Now gnashing of the teeth means the absence of the bread, but the gnashing here is actually, it's a character that's going to come up, it's a mocking spirit that's going to fight, it's going to begin to fight against this word. For many are called, but few are chosen. I just want to expand a little bit on that area of darkness. Praise God. That darkness there means away from the glory. And a lot of the time it's in the eyes. That's why he said, by, by the eye, eye salve to restore the eyes. The prophetic eye and the prophetic ear to hear. When anywhere in scripture you'll find that Moses, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 37, it says that he was 120 years of age and that his eye never grew dim. He prophetically never grew dim. He knew what symbol and types and shadows where God was moving and amongst what he was in. He knew where God was. And that's a picture for us today, to having the eyes to see where the spirit of God is moving and walking in. We do not want to be push, pushed aside into outer darkness, away from the glory, and not knowing, having the eye to see and the ear to hear the language of this hour. Amen? Moses, 120, I never grew dim. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2 and 7. We pick up of the story of Eli, the high priest at that time. Samuel, the young man, was, was, was away from Eli. It says in Scripture that Eli's eye had grown dim now, waxed dim. He no longer could see any longer. It's a picture of those who are outside and away from the glory of God, of this feast of the Day of Atonement. They're away from the glory. He fell asleep on the floor, Scripture says in Scripture, Eli, his eyes waxed dim, and the candle, which is the menorah the, in the church age, which is the representation of the church age, it went out. The light of that glory, it went out. Because we need to enter in, into the glory of the Father, which is sonship. We need to go into that glory. Can I give you one more? Of the dimming of the eyes... Lamentations chapter 5 verse 7, 7 says this, that the dimming of the eyes is because of the faintness of one's heart. For these things our eyes have become dim. Lamentations 5 17 says that. For this is our heart. People don't have a heart for this. God is going to find out the heart. He is discerner of the intent of the heart. The mind and the heart of the believer. Just as he did in Passover and Pentecost. Here he's searching the minds and the hearts of God's people. Whether they go on if they love him. See, Lamentations 5.17. For this is our heart. Our heart is now faint. That word faint means it's menstruating. It's bleeding. It's aborting the seed of this word. And because of that, it's aborting the seed of this word. The word of the revelation for now, the day of atonement. It, because it's aborting that seed... Their eye now has become dim. They can't see this. This is prophetic language, people of God. And God is now schooling, training us, giving us the Holy Spirit to anoint our eyes with eyes out, to open up the eyes of our spirit that we might see and hear the understanding of our day of atonement, that we can walk into the Feast of Tabernacles. We can become one with His Word. Ah, oh, hallelujah. This is God's intention. God's intention. Oh. Revelations chapter 8. And I'll finish here. The principle of third. 
One third, one third, two thirds. We'll cut off one third. One third are going into the fire. Revelations chapter 8. We understand that the trumpet one, two, three, and four are speaking into the one third. This one third is the company of people that God is going to begin to deal with the core of their soul. That's where the man of sin lies. He's hidden in there by darkness. I'll just pick it up in verse 7 quickly. The first angel sounded. This is the prophetic word, the intention of God's word. There followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Hail and fire. Hail speaks about the word that's the treasures of the heavens, things of the spirit of God. And it had fire, the intent of God's word. When it leaves the spirit realm, it comes as the refiner fire. It is like fire in the next dimension. It comes to the core of the soul like refiner's fire. That's why it was hailed in the spirit. It moves and it transforms itself to the intent to become the refiner's fire. It's mingled but with blood. That blood there is the blood of the second Adam. The second the last Adam. It's the second man, sorry. It's the blood of the second man, the new man which came up out of, out of the grave, Jesus brought forth the new man. That's the blood. That's the blood that this word is, is coming with. Amen? And they were cast upon the earth. This is, in the, this is now. And the third part of the trees, this is inside the believer. Trees, amen? What do they deal? The trees of the field, what? They clap their hands. Jesus, when, that, um, when he went to the blind man, what did he say? And he opened up his eyes. I can see men as what? Trees. So trees here in the scripture is actually men. But this is prophetic language. He says, so the trees is the one third. It's this company of people. It says that the trees, the part of the trees, one third of the part of the trees, that's the believers now in tabernacle, was burnt up. Why was it burnt up? God is going to deal with and eradicate that one third. All the green grass was burned up. Green grass here speaks about the fading of man's glory. God is going to take away the fading glory of man and replace it with the eternal covenant of his glory, which is sonship. If you keep on reading down progressively down that word, you'll find second trumpet, third trumpet, and fourth trumpet are dealing with this company of people that are in the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the refiner's fire. We are moving into this. This is now. And God, this fire has an intent. It's not to destroy you. It's to transform you. He loves you incredibly. I can't wait to come back next week and speak again in part two. We're talking about the refiner's fire. We're entering into the fullness of God's glory, the eternal covenant, which is sonship. I want to thank you again. God bless you. If you would like to donate or if you'd like to sow a seed towards the ministry um, that we can keep on doing the will of the Father, we don't take a pay from it. None of this is given to the ministers. This is all purely used for the ministry to get this word out to the nations of the earth. That's our purpose and our will, to get this eternal covenant, the word and the feast of tabernacles, out to the four corners of the earth. We love you. God bless you. And see you next time. And remember, the best is yet. It's still to come.